Hi everyone, uh, I'm Rav, a Senior Associate in Corporate, and today I'm joined by Lubna Shuja. Thanks for joining us, Lubna. Thank you for inviting me. Um, a few facts that I'm sure you've heard lots before, but I think it's quite significant, so we'll say them again. Uh, you're the first Asian, the first Muslim, and the seventh female president of the Law Society. Um, the Law Society has been around for a long time, so that's... It has, almost 200 years. Yes. Almost, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I'd like to go back to, to the start. Um, I'd like to talk about you as a teenager growing up and whether law was something that you always thought you wanted to do. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't something that I always um, thought I wanted. Well, it was something I hadn't even given any consideration to, to be honest with you. Uh, I mean, you all know, coming from an Asian background and an Asian family, Obviously, you know, Asian parents have the three kind of key things they want, want their children to do. It's going to be doctor, accountant or lawyer. Yeah. That's kind of the basic, you know. Um, but when I was a lot younger, I didn't really think law was going to be for somebody like me. Okay. Um, I was from a working class background. I went to state comprehensive school. I'm from Bradford originally. And I didn't know any lawyers. I didn't know very much about law. Uh, I really thought it was more of a white middle-class profession, not something that somebody like me, a, a, an Asian Muslim female, would be able to get into. Um, so I didn't really give it a lot of thought, and it wasn't something that my teachers talked to me about at school either. So um, what it actually ended up happening, when I was at school, I was kind of, what am I going to do, what am I going to do, as many of us do when we're younger, if we don't have a, a very clear plan. Uh, and I, I had a couple of cousins who were journalists, they worked at the BBC. Right. And they used to talk to me about their jobs and, you know, tell me about the documentaries that they were working on. Uh, and that was where I, having listened to them, thought, I could do that. That's something I could go into. And, you know, at the time, I didn't realise it because we never talked about role models. Mm. We never talked about, you know, you can, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. Yeah. But when I look back... That's obviously what was happening. You know, yeah. I saw my cousins working as journalists and I thought, I could, if they can do that, I can do that. So I started off, I got myself um, a place to do English at university because I thought, you know, if you want to go into journalism, you need to have an English degree. Um, but when I got my A-level grades, I did a lot better in my A-levels than my teachers had predicted. Right. They obviously didn't have a lot of confidence in me, but anyway, <laughs> I did a lot better than they predicted. And uh, it was at that stage, a really good friend said to me, you could get onto a law degree with those grades. Why don't you look at going on to, you know, look at, look at doing law? You could, you know, if you want to go into journalism, you still can. There'll be lots of options open to you, though. It will open up other options. So... Again, put a seed in my head. Mm. And I thought, oh, maybe I can get on. I mean, I think the... the the, the truth of the matter is, I didn't think I was good enough to do law. I think that's what it came down. I didn't think I was bright enough. I didn't think I was good enough to get onto a law degree. So when somebody said to me, you could do law, I thought, okay, let's look into this. Mm. And I did. And I got onto a law degree through clearing. Okay. That's, that's how I started. I actually uh, went to, um, back then, it was called the Polytechnic of Central London. Now it's Westminster University. Yeah. Um, and that's where my journey into law started. I got onto a law degree. That was my first exposure to law. You know, growing up, I didn't watch, I didn't even watch legal dramas on television. We had three channels when I was growing up on TV. You know, mm. we had ITV, BBC One, BBC Two. That was it. Uh, it wasn't 24-hour TV. You know, you couldn't just flick around channels and find something that, you know, you were interested in. You just watch whatever was on. So I didn't really have a lot of exposure to, to law. And when I started studying for my law degree and started learning about cases, learning about legislation, learning about how they applied to everyday life and how precedents were created mm. and how new law was made, um, I was absolutely hooked. I was fascinated. Sold. And I thought, that's it. I want to be a lawyer. This is what I want to do. Yeah. And that is literally where my journey started. Okay. It's, I find it really interesting that... You maybe wanted to do English and then you switched to law. And I think, it. you know, when I went to university, I studied history. And my parents thought, 
yeah, <laughs> what is he I doing? Don't really understand. Why are you doing history? And how am I yeah. going to tell everyone yeah. that my son's studying history rather yeah. than law? Yeah. Um, and I explained about the GDL, and now it's you yeah. know it's, it's slightly different, but um, certainly back then, and perhaps even more so for you, by the sounds of it, you were supposed to just go straight to university and do something where you would get a job absolutely. as a result of your degree. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how much of that sort of um, family influence and societal influence? Did that, um, how much did that impact your decision about to study? I mean, I'm sure similar to your background and similar to the background of many, many um, South Asians, my parents always drilled into me from a very, very early age, education, education, education. Uh, so I always knew that if I could, I wanted to go to university. You know, they wanted us to be able to be financially independent mm. and they, you know, Parents always want more for their children than they've managed to achieve themselves. So I was very um, alert to that. I wanted to go to university. I knew I wanted to um, study for a degree. To be fair, they never really put pressure on me in terms of what they wanted me to do. For them, it was just about get an education, get a good degree. That means you'll be able to get a good job. So when I actually managed to get on to do law, because going back to, you know, traditionally parents are very much doctor, lawyer, accountant was, yeah. you know, that was like the professions to get your children into. They were delighted when I got onto a law degree yeah. because for them, that was a real, you know, we've done what we came here to do. Mm. We've got her onto a good degree. Hopefully she's going to have a good career, good profession. Uh, we've done our job. Yeah. So I was very fortunate that um, I think I stumbled into a good good uh, uh, degree yeah. quite by accident, but much to their delight. Yes. Okay, mm. great. So let's talk a bit about your entry into the professional world. So you trained at a West End firm in London. I did, yeah. Um, and then you qualified and did you stay on at that firm? No, or? I didn't actually because, as I say, I'm originally from Bradford. So I did my uh, training contract with them, went back to Bradford and I actually got a job with a high street practice mm -hmm. in Bradford uh, doing litigation, civil litigation. Um, I knew when I was doing my training, um, when I did my litigation seat, um, <laughs> I literally almost every day I used to get sent to the Royal Courts of Justice, right. to the Bear Garden. Yeah before the masters, yeah. which was scary as hell, <laughs> but a great baptism of fire yeah. into kind of litigation. You just get and, lost in that building Oh, absolutely, as well. I mean, absolutely. but just, I loved yeah. it, I loved it. And again, it, it's, it's almost um, going there, it kind of brings you back to the kind of the legal heritage, mm. the history, you know, and I, it, it was fantastic, I loved it. I loved going to court, um, I loved dealing with cases. So I knew quite early on, yeah. I want to do litigation. I want to go to court. I want to, you know, that was what that was what excited me. So when I got offered a job to do that in in Bradford, I was very happy with that, and I went back to do that. Okay, and so as as a South Asian woman um, going into the legal profession, I'm assuming that you didn't see many people who looked like yourself. No, that's absolutely true. Um, I mean, we're talking about the early 1990s. Yeah, uh, very few women in the profession. Not many people who were black, Asian or minority ethnic background. I didn't know it at that time. And I've learned it much, much later subsequently since I've been working at the Law Society because they look at statistics over mm. the years. But it turns out that when I was coming into the profession, there were only 709 solicitors yeah. who were from black, Asian or minority ethnic background. Yeah. And it's so funny because when I, when I give that figure, if I'm you know, meeting people or talking to people. And I mentioned to them there are only 709 solicitors. I've actually had uh, solicitors come up to me and say, I was one of the 709. Yeah. I was one of them because there were so few of us. Yeah. Um, so there weren't many of us and not many women. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember the first firm that I started working with, uh, they had a rule that women weren't allowed to wear trousers. Which now, when you think back, it, it's almost ludicrous. Yeah. How can you say women can't wear trousers? But, you know, it was, it was quite normal. Women yeah. were not allowed to wear trousers. If you went into court, you did not, you know, women did not wear trousers in court. Yeah. And somebody told me recently, they remembered being in court, and this is in the you know, mid-1990s. A woman came into court wearing trousers, was about to make submissions to the judge, 
And the judge actually said to her, you can't address me, I can't hear from you, you're not appropriately dressed, and refused to let her make submissions. Mm. That's how crazy it was back then. So, um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, times have changed. I'm really pleased to say times have changed. I pushed back with my firm. Yeah. And I said to them, look, you need to change this rule. It discriminates against me as a woman, discriminates against me as a, as a Muslim female. I'm in Bradford. I'm in a very traditional community. What I wear matters mm. because, you know, my clients will judge me on how I look. Uh, and it took time. It took a number of years. But eventually they did change that rule. Yeah. Um, and I'm pleased to see, you know, it, it has evolved. And across the legal profession, that's not an issue anymore. Yeah. And so now there's, I mean, I was looking at this earlier, but there's, I think, over 20,000 lawyers from an ethnic minority background. Yeah, the statistics now. So, so the Law Society, we represent just over 220,000 solicitors okay. across England and Wales. 17% of them yeah. are from a black, Asian or minority ethnic background. When you break that down, because the other thing that we tend to do is we just lump everybody together mm. when we're talking about statistics. If you bring it down to how many of those are from a South Asian heritage background, we're about 10%. Okay. And then again, you know, you can't just lump all South Asian uh, yeah. uh, solicitors into, into one kind of figure. When you look at that 10%, those who are from uh, Indian heritage are very highly represented in that figure. Whereas those who are from a Bangladeshi heritage are very underrepresented in that figure. Yeah. So, you know, when we look at figures, we still need to break it down further and yeah. just look carefully at well, what is actually going on within that figure. But generally, we're doing quite well as black, Asian and minority ethnic solicitors at 17% because that's higher than the overall population, which I think is around 12% at the moment. Okay. And I suppose you or also the workforce, have to... workforce, rather. Yeah. The, the, yeah. 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 I suppose you also have to look at what positions those people are in and yeah. if they're in senior positions yeah. and how many of those are women. Yeah. And so I suppose there's a lot of data for you guys to work through. Absolutely, um, absolutely. And yeah. I, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to cover, um, but sort of skipping forward to your work with the Law Society, if you could tell us a bit about how you got involved with the Law Society. Yeah. Um, and up to where you are now at the very top. Yeah, sure. Um, so, as I said, I've been a solicitor for about 30 years now. Yeah. Um, I worked with the uh, high street firm in Bradford for about 13 years altogether. Uh, then I moved to Birmingham and uh, I set up my own practice. I'm a sole practitioner. My, my firm's called Legal Swan Solicitors, based in Birmingham. I've still got that now. And when I became a sole practitioner, I then started to get involved with other sole practitioners and sole practitioner um, networks. Um, and that's when uh, I kind of f started to find out more about the Law Society Council. Up until then, I hadn't known a great deal about what the Law Society was doing, how they supported solicitors. Um, I used to read my Law Society Gazette regularly, obviously, yeah. as I'm sure you do, and everybody course, is <laughs> daily. who is watching yeah. us. Um, but I didn't know a great deal about what kind of work the Law Society was doing. So when I got involved with the um, Solicitor Network, uh, Sole Practitioner Networks, I became the chair of one of the um, Sole Practitioner Networks that I was involved in. And after I finished my role as chair, they uh, said to me, um, you know, you'd be great representing the interests of sole practitioners on the Law Society Council. Okay. So that was where I first started to get involved with the Law Society. Um, and I was just amazed by the amount of work that goes on there that we don't necessarily, I mean, hopefully it's a lot better now and we do, we do find out, you know, what kind of work is going on there. But I started that, that was back in 2013, I joined the council. Mm. Uh, I then started to get involved with other work at the Law Society. I got involved with committees. I got onto the um, membership and, uh, the, and originally it was called the Membership Board. Uh, it then became the Membership and Communications Committee. I became the chair of that. I then got onto the Law Society Board, uh, the overall board that we had. So I did a lot of work with the council for a number of years. Uh, and actually during the course of that, other people started to say to me, have you thought about putting yourself forward for president? Yeah. And it's really funny because, I mean, somebody said this to me probably about five years ago, five or six years ago. That was the first time somebody said to me, 
have you thought, you know, would you would you consider putting yourself forward for, 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 for president? And I actually said to them, don't be so stupid. And this is only five or six years ago. I said, don't be so stupid. We'd never have a non-white president. Yeah, OK. Even five or six years ago, I could not see that yeah. as a reality. That's because you, you, there was no example. I, there'd never there been no one. Model. Yeah. Was just, yeah. yeah, there'd never been one. Every yeah. single president had been a white president. Uh, I... During the time that I was on council, there was no female president. Yeah. Um, up until I put myself forward for uh, for president, mm. um, so I I kind of thought no, I don't I, I can't I can't. It was just not a reality to me. It was like don't be ridiculous. It's, yeah. That's not going to happen. Yeah. And then slowly over the next two three years, um, you know, I, as I got more and more involved with the Law Society board and the work that I was doing on the Membership and Communications Committee, which is a really key committee mm. because it's all about member services, um, member communications, you know, what are we doing for members? How do we get that word out? And more and more people started saying to me, you should really put yourself forward. You, you know, we think you'd be good at it. Yeah. And that's, again, it's going back to puts a seed in your head. Yeah. And then you start thinking, well, maybe, mm. maybe I could do it. Maybe I could do it. Maybe... And then I kind of thought, you know what, I'm going to have a go. Yeah. I'm going to have a go. Uh, and, and, you know, this is going back to, and I have to say, it's been the case throughout my career. Often, other people will see the potential in you. Yes. Before you see that potential, before you even think of that potential in yourself. Other people will see it. Mm. And they're your allies. And they're so, so, so important in your life. Um, and it was all these other people that put the seed in my head to say, yeah. you could do that. Yeah. You'd be really good at that. You should put yourself forward for that. So I did. And I was very, very fortunate. Uh, you know, with the support of my colleagues, I got through on the first time I put myself forward. Yeah. And I was elected. And then it's just been, wow, this is actually happening. Yeah. <laughs> and here I am. And here you are. So that's how it kind of happened. And hopefully, and I'm sure others within the law society and the legal profession will look at you and think, well, if Lubna can do Absolutely. it, so can I. And, Absolutely. It and they can. Matter what I look and like. they can. Yeah. And they can. Absolutely. And they will. And I will not be the last. I really will not be the last. I am sure there will be others coming through. And I hope that I've helped to make that journey a little bit easier. Yeah. I hope. Absolutely. But uh, I'm, I'm sure. confident that things are changing. Yeah, yeah, for the better, absolutely. For the better, yeah. Um, so so it's, it's not the only thing that you're focused on, but diversity, equality and inclusion in yeah. the legal profession is clearly very important to you. Absolutely. Um, there's always things that we can do to improve, DE, DE and I. Um, so what's on your agenda? How do you plan on tackling it and making it better? Yeah, I mean, you're right. Diversity is one of my, uh, or it has been one of my presidential priorities Although I put it down as a priority, actually, it was a given for me. You know, yeah. It kind of underpins yeah, yeah. everything that I do because of who I am, because of my background. I'm really pleased that now, and I think we've, you know, we've talked about the statistics already, 17% of our profession is now Black, Asian, minority, ethnic. Women, we're now 52% of the profession is yeah. female. So we are literally tipping the scales. Mm. More women than men in the profession. So I think that's a really great statistic, and it's great to see that coming into the profession. But where we are not seeing um, that translate is progression. So where we're looking at senior levels of the profession, we're not seeing as many females, we're not seeing as many black, Asian, minority, ethnic solicitors getting to senior levels of the uh, profession. We're not seeing them get to the senior levels of the judiciary. Those are areas that I really want to work on. Um, I've had a focus on that. Really important that, you know, if we want to reflect society, we need to reflect it across all aspects of our profession, not just at entry level. And what we're finding is um, those people who are coming in at entry level, who are from a black, Asian, minority, ethnic background, they, a lot of them are finding they're stunted. Right. Because they're not progressing. And that makes them leave the profession or leave the firms that they're businesses that they're working in. Yeah. You know, when you look at sole practitioners, a third of sole practitioners are from a black, Asian and minority ethnic background. And, you know, we know from talking to them 
that they do that because they don't see themselves progressing within the firms, the larger firms that they're working in. Right. So, you know, it is about how do we tackle that? What can we do to tackle that? How do we change that? Because, you know, it's not just it's not just a good business decision. Business-wise, diversity is really, really important because you're bringing in diverse perspectives, you're bringing in different ideas, innovation comes from different experiences. Yeah. And um, that's important for business. You know, it's a good business reason. Mm. But also clients, yeah. they want to see themselves reflected yes. in the organizations that they are instructing. You know, often somebody will interpret the law according to their own religion, mm. their own customs, their own cultural backgrounds. And when it comes to acting for them, they are often a lot more confident, a lot more comfortable if they've got somebody who's dealing with them who understands their customs, their religion, their background, who understands yeah. how they have ended up in the position that they are in. So, you know, if clients think that you understand them, they trust you. Yeah. They trust you. They work better with you. It leads to better business relationships. It leads to more business and better business. So there is a business imperative to have that in place as well. Yeah. And so that's, that's the progression side of when you're in a law firm. But I suppose it all starts with access to Absolutely. the legal industry. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm sure a lot of people who are listening or watching um, will be very keen to understand what the Law Society is doing to try and help them get into the industry, particularly given the economic climate we find ourselves in. I mean, everything is very expensive. Yeah. Degrees are nine grand a year. I know, I know. Um, and a training contract at the end of it isn't guaranteed. I know. Yeah. So, and, and I think it, it, there is clearly a link between those from a black, Asian, ethnic minority background and those in working class mm. backgrounds mm. where they might not necessarily be able to afford to go to university in the conventional way. Um, so I, I'm not sure if there's anything that you guys... Yeah, I mean, about. I've got really... I feel quite quite passionate when we talk about... Because I have to tell you, and I didn't mention this earlier, when I, when, when I was studying and I, and I got on to do a law degree in the early 19... Sorry, not... It was the 19, late 1980s. God, I'm giving my age away now. <laughs> late 1980s, I went, I, I, I went to do my law degree. And back then, you could get a grant from your local authority to pay for your maintenance, uh, some of your maintenance and your tuition fees. Uh, and in fact, you could get a grant to do, back then it was the solicitor's finals examination. You know, since then it's become the legal practice course and now it's become the solicitor's qualifying examination. Mm. And I know, I absolutely know 100%, if I hadn't got a grant way back then, there's no way I would have gone to university. I could not have afforded yeah. to go. There were no such thing as loans back then. And I would not, my parents couldn't afford to pay for me to go to university. So for me, even now, you know, I really feel for students who end up leaving university with these huge kind of loans hanging around their necks that they've got to pay back. And, you know, often they don't yeah. have the guarantee of a job to do that. So, um, I mean, what do we do? So first of all, let's just talk a little bit about apprenticeships. I think that is a great new introduction in terms of um, giving another pathway to qualifying as a solicitor. Uh, and I know that that's proved to be very popular within not only uh, students, but also within law firms. More and more and more are now looking at taking on apprentices and helping them to prepare for the solicitor's qualifying exam. And, you know, they can earn while they learn, which is a, a fantastic way of qualifying yeah. um, without having to take on the huge loans. So that's one thing which I think has been a good development. What we do, at, what we're doing at the Law Society, we, I mean, there are lots and lots of things that we are doing. We have got a diversity access scheme that we have been running for a number of years now. And what that does um, is we offer students uh, places where they get funding to do their, uh, uh, well, it used to be the legal practice course. It would now be the 
SQE. Mm. We help them with work experience. We help them getting mentors. And the, these places are sponsored by law firms. Right. So, you know, we always encourage law firms. We actually, when we started it, the scheme's been running for a number of years. I think it's, I think it's almost 10 years now we've been running that scheme. When we first started doing it, there were only about 10 places available. So it was quite, you know, it's very competitive. Um, and it's specifically aimed at those from underprivileged backgrounds, um, those from, you know, low income families who wouldn't otherwise be able to get onto doing, you know, get, be able to qualify as solicitors. Now, uh, I, I'm trying to remember the statistics now and make sure I don't give you the wrong statistic, but I think we're now at around 30 or possibly even 50, I think it's probably 30 places that we offer. And every year, that's going up because we're getting more and more people that are um, more and more firms and businesses yeah. that, that really want to, you know, sponsor a place and, and give opportunities to students. So we're doing we're doing what we can in that space. We give out lots and lots of information, lots and lots of tips. I mean, one of the things that I didn't know when I came into the profession um, was that you can work in house. Yeah. Nobody talked to me yeah, about yeah. in house. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know it was a thing, and. Now, uh, I've already mentioned 220,000 solicitors, 25% of them work in-house. Yeah. So that's another area that I really encourage people, explore in-house as well as an opportunity. The reason you're here is because it's South Asian Heritage Month. Before we started filming, I openly said to you, I didn't know it existed yeah. up until about three weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, so it'd be great if you could just tell us why you think it's important that people celebrate it. and what it is. Yeah. So South Asian Heritage Month, I have to admit, I stumbled across it as well, uh, probably about three or so years ago. And I think it's a fantastic opportunity to really celebrate the um, contributions that are made by South Asians to uh, society, to law, you know, there are so many, we've mm. talked about the number of South Asian solicitors that we've got in law. But I think it's also a really important time to educate people. Yeah. Um, South Asian Heritage Month, it runs from, um, I've got to get the dates right now, I think it's the 16th of July through to the 17th of August, and it will be that month every single year. Yeah. Uh, and the reason for that is it's all based around the creation of uh, India and Pakistan and Bangladesh and a number of other South Asian countries that, that were formed during that period. But it's also a time to remember the sacrifices that some of our parents and grandparents made to give us the opportunities that we have now. And, you know, growing up and certainly in my early days as a solicitor, I was quite embarrassed about my kind of yeah. heritage and my Asian life and my background. Uh, so I didn't really talk about it when I was at school or at work or, yeah. you know, it was just kind of, you just wanted to blend in. Yeah. You wanted to be, you know, the first, the, you know, wherever I worked, I generally was the only Asian person within that firm. Yes. Yeah. Generally, they were all kind of predominantly white people. So I didn't really want to talk to them about fasting. Mm. And about Eid, you know, why don't you know what day Eid is? Why don't yeah. you know? You know, I, I wasn't confident enough to have those conversations. Um, so initially, I really kind of just hid who 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 I was and what yeah. my background was and what my heritage was. But you know, over time, I realised it's really really important to educate people and yeah. to talk about that because that is who that's what makes you who you are. Yeah, and those differences are your strengths. Yes. Those differences are what makes you who you are and what makes you unique and what makes you bring something different to the business. Yeah. So I realized over time, don't hide it. No. Enjoy it, celebrate it, and, um, you know, tell people about it. Because actually, most people are genuinely interested. Yeah. Genuinely interested. Yeah. And, you know, who doesn't love a Bollywood film? Yeah. Who doesn't love Asian Indian food? Yeah. Who doesn't love Bangra dancing? You know, we got so yeah, much absolutely. culture, heritage, so much to celebrate. And, you know, we want people to enjoy that. We want people to be a part of that and embrace it. I think I've shown the whole firm my wedding video. So, and I showed you before we started this <laughs> and it was And it was so. fantastic. As <laughs> I go. said to you, it's like a little mini Bollywood film. You should be very yeah, proud of it. There very, you very go. proud of it. Very proud of it.
Okay, some quick fire questions oh dear, to, okay. to finish off. Yep. Your favourite South Asian food? Oh, food. Ah, I've got to think about that one. I love alu prate. Okay. I love tarkadal. Yeah. Actually, curry full stop. Just I mean, any curry, yeah. Any curry. Bradford any curry. has some great places Bradford as well. Bradford is fantastic yeah. for um, Asian restaurants. And Birmingham as well, because I'm in too. Birmingham now. Yeah. Great, great for Asian food. But yeah, I think I think when I go to a restaurant, I'm always on the hunt for a good alu prata. Yeah. <laughs> Akbar's in Birmingham. I know. Very good. And my mum's family from Solihull. Oh, so, are they? Uh, there we go. Well. Yeah. Um, and then finally, what does South Asian heritage mean to you in three words? Oh, in three words. Remember, educate, celebrate. Amazing. Yeah. Um, when I qualified, I qualified in 2017. Um, I never thought I would see a person who looks like me with the same colour being the president of the Law Society. We just didn't have that. And yeah. I never thought that we would get there, actually. And it feels like we've made so much progress in those six years. Um, so I think just on behalf of everyone, I want to thank you for the work that you've done. Uh, you've inspired me and I think you'll inspire loads of people who are listening to this. Oh, thank so, you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank and you. Continue doing the great work. Thank you so much. Thank you.